and welcome to today's webinar on identifying risks and fraud in commercial lending. I'm pleased to be joined by two colleagues here at Quantexa, Alex Braid, who is the Global Head of Credit Risk Solutions, and Ivan Hurd, who is the Global Head of Fraud Solutions. I'm also be pleased uh, to be joined by Peter May, who is the Group Head of Wholesale Markets and Internal Fraud at HSBC. Thank you very much for all three of you for joining me on today's webinar. And really, it is an interesting topic to think about identifying assessment of fraud and fraud risk when we think about uh, lending in uh, the market. As part of that today, we're very much going to be focused on talking a little bit about what is the current state of the lending market today? Uh, what importance does technology play and what influence has technology had over the last couple of years to help us with the trends in the lending space? And also a contentious topic, but one that we're seeing more and more come up in terms of the convergence between credit and reputation with fraud risk and how do all three risk types go hand in hand? And to wrap it all up, what do we see going forward? What do we see the market going? And I encourage you all to use the questions tab, which is on the right hand side of your panel, to post comments and any additional insights that you would like to uh, cover with us today. So where is the market today when we think about commercial lending? And there's kind of three facets in which we have looked at this. Uh, one is more from a global level. And there's no denying that the globe as a whole is very much moving to a digitalized and, and a lending transformation path, a journey. A lot of institutions, what I tend to call, have set themselves a risk 2025 um, goal. We're very much by the year 2025, a lot of their processes, a lot of their systems want to be going through that transformation, that risk transformation, the lending transformation, being able to automate as they go through that journey. Another pillar of the trends in a global space is very much being customer centric and thinking about the customer first and how does everything follow from what the customer needs. And I think it wouldn't be a, a, a webinar and a conversation if I'm not, I'm not going to mention ESG in terms of there is a lot of ESG lending goals out there to think about what lending do I want to do by 2030? what percentage of that lending has to be ESG friendly. And the other part of it is, I cannot mention it without the global COVID lending schemes that have been around on a global level, varying country to country, but they have been a core at the, uh, the core of the industry over the past couple of years. When I move a little bit from a global to a, an EMEA and a regional focus is we've seen a lot of volatility over the past three years. Uh, that volatility has begun with Brexit. It actually came before COVID, but with the Brexit transition, with the plans of Brexit, it started to bring a lot of market volatility into uh, the lending community and the lending markets. And to take that volatility, to think about how can I connect to more, to more data, to more people, to more technology, to better get more out of those uh, data points and those analytics and to really increase the scalability or the agility of my institution to get the most effectiveness and efficiencies from what we have today. And again, it wouldn't be a webinar if I didn't mention the COVID lending schemes. If I move slightly to the, to the right and I think about UK specifically, it's very much been over the last couple of years, uh, digital first, digital only, which has seen the most thriving um, kind of enhancements and, and kind of uh, ammunitions. There's also a lot of competition, a lot of speed and agility that is being associated with it. There's been a huge emphasis on buy now and pay later schemes, very much thinking of different ways of thinking about the customer first. Um, but when you think about UK or regional EMEA or global, at the heart of it is data, technology, and analytics that comes out of the, the use of the data and technology. And I guess I just wanted to pause there and ask Peter as well, you know, does he see from a HSBC perspective, similar trends to what I've just summarized from UK to a global network? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the, um, the journey we've been on as a bank, um, it feels very similar to what, what we what we see from, from our peer organizations uh, and also the, the local and regional banks that operate uh, in those markets. 
Uh, we don't have to look too far for some big kind of global events uh, where the ramifications have been felt kind of cross border and across region. You know, we've seen, you know, US listed companies from China uh, experiencing problems. Um, we've had you know, a Middle East client, you know, Middle East, um, Middle East name you know, listed on the UK exchange with, with similar problems. So it's very much a, it is a global issue uh, and we need to tackle it uh, in a global way. But there are definitely regional flavors as well. Uh, I think uh, all those points you made around um, you know, reducing customer friction, you know, speed of funds uh, is driving the industry uh, and uh, keeping pace with the, um, you know, with what we want to give customers, um, you know, we, it's really important we bring the right controls, the right technology to to build those, um, that, that, that true oversight of the networks uh, and also get comfortable with the uh, financial information that, uh, that, that underpins those decisions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Peter. So to stay on you, Peter, I'm going to get the audience a little bit warmed up uh, with a poll question, um, which talks about have you, the audience, seen a, an accelerated view in the market or in your institutions that thinks about convergence of credit, reputational and fraud risk um, in recent years? Yes, no, or somewhat with more convergence needed? Peter, I mean, there's, there's a lot of talk around this and, and credit officers um, are, are deemed to be thinking they should be credit officers should be thinking of fraud risk to be like credit risk or to be credit risk and I guess the question goes to that but what are your thoughts around should credit officers think of fraud of like credit risk? I think fraud and credit risk are two sides of the same coin um, but I do have a lot of sympathy with uh, you know people in the uh, you yeah, know, credit sanctioning space and, and the people writing those credit proposals. Um, you know, these these relationships, it's a foundation of trust and we place trust in the institutions around that, you know, the auditors um, uh, and, and, you know, for you know, listed companies, we trust on listing rules and those um, yeah. those kind of safeguards. But I think what we've, what we've obviously learned, uh, you know, to our cost as, as bankers is is that uh, trust can be abused uh, systemically uh, and, and some of the trust we can place in those institutions who are who are uh, linked to um, you know, the, the quality of the financial statements in particular um, haven't always been found to be as robust as we need them to be. Okay, uh, Alex, do you tend to agree before I share the results and, and get Ivan's comments? Alex, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I would agree on that. And I think one one great example that really stares us in the face is the uh, bounce back loan scheme in the UK. So if you think about that, banks were, were guided not to do credit checks and the result has been a hell of a lot of fraud. So there's a, a direct link there between credit and fraud. And if I just bring that to life with one example, um, I, I recently saw a case where uh, the bank's lending process declined a, a risky director, an application by them. They were creative. They actually transferred the business into the name of a new lower risk director. They reapplied. It got auto approved as part of a, a straight through processing. And then after the funds were deposited in the account, that old director came back on. And you can see it all in the data. Perfect. Thank you. And Ivan, as I share the results, what do you think? Yes, no, or somewhat more convergence needed? I, I think there'll be a, an overwhelming sort of movement to say yes or, or at least somewhat because I definitely think um, we, we, we all recognise that more collaboration is required in order to get the answer um, and so definitely there's a trend in the conversations that I've had in, in recent times that the fraud teams uh, can't operate independently from the credit decisioning cycle. They very much have to be working in collaboration because ultimately the data that they need to make those informed decisions is somewhat the same but like Peter said um, there's a difference between relying upon what you're being told versus using the full context around those businesses to make an independent and um, sort of thoroughly evidence-based decision. Perfect. And I think the, the audience, and thank you everyone for your poll uh, submissions, 56% 50, of today's participants agree with you, Ivan. 11% um, think no. Um, but there's actually 33% of the audience that believe that there's a lot more uh, convergence that's needed. So thank you very much for everybody for taking uh, part in that uh, in that poll. I'm going to hand over to Alex now to talk more about the convergence and what he has seen in the market uh, when it comes to these linkages and lineages. Sure, thanks. Well, I think I'd start off just by saying that, you know, everyone is connected. Um, companies trade with each other. Um, they may share directors or they might use a serviced office address. And so that's quite clear when you see connected data for normal low risk businesses. But what you find when people are committing fraud is they're actually more highly connected. And therefore, 
it effectively takes a network to catch a network. Now, network shapes are really powerful in detecting unusual patterns. And one of the uh, examples here that we've done a lot of work on is around risky incorporation agents and shell or shelf companies. And we've seen a lot of co uh, correlation actually between some of the, the loans that have been uh, applied for that have come from uh, these shelf companies that were originally produced by a, an incorporation agent. And, and the types of information you see in the data in these shapes is a highly connected central node with a, um, a highly sort of disconnected new director. And I just wanted to kind of bring that to life to, to show you how you can use a traditional, um, more document-based credit models with more network-based fraud features together to actually get a higher performing view of risk understanding. Um, another thing I'll just bring out is, is around um, the Phoenix companies and, and thanks for coming up to this one. So this is an example um, of, of how you can see the data in a shape. Um, so if I just describe what you're seeing on screen here, we have a set of companies laid out in uh, incorporation date order. So the, the earliest one is on the left and that was actually 1996. And then you have a bit of a gap uh, until quite a flurry of activity around 2018 and 19. Um, what we can see here is that that blue ring of, of companies on the left, those are actually all dissolved. There's about 14 of them. Um, four of them never traded, they were dormant, one was insolvent very rapidly, but there's a high degree of connectivity between either directors underneath or the shared addresses on the top. And if you just click on one more please Roshni, you can see on the right hand side in that little yellow box there you've got eight active companies, actually many of those uh, applied for and were eligible for um, or successfully received COVID loans and they from going from quite a, a sort of a poor uh, set of performance in the past, you know, not much um, evidence of, of real genuine businesses. It seems like these have suddenly claimed to be turning over around a million pounds each and are, have actually received a, a bounce back loan. And in one instance, one of them swapped that for an even bigger uh, C bill, which was four times larger. Just, just before I finish on this network, I've, I've anonymize this network on purpose but effectively business one two and three which are the ones with the blue rings in the middle they actually had the same name the exact identical same name they were incorporated and dissolved so the first one was six years dormant account filings and business two was just incorporated by a similar group of connected people connected addresses just six days later and then business three was the one that actually got the the loan so it's it's a very good example of a uh, you know, a successful Phoenix company operation with some of the classic features, same industry, same people, um, same sick code, same types of business. And um, this, this really, to me, describes how you can use the power of networks and data to, to look for these risks. Peter, what, what, was, what are your thoughts on this example? Well, I just I, I just love looking at these slides. I just love seeing the power of the data. Um, I think you know, having uh, spent many evenings trawling companies' house data, it's great to see that you know at a press of a button we can see these networks. Um, for me, the quality of a of an alert like this, it 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 really you know it's very impactful. People can really get behind and see the patterns and trends. Um, it's almost you don't spend time debating the issue it allows you to make a risk-based decision very very quickly you can score this data and allows an organization very quickly to prioritize how to work through these situations and what steps to take uh, to, to best mitigate the risk whether it's credit risk or indeed in, in, this, in these situations where you know your you know, uh, banks like ours are relying on government guarantees we've got we've got you know, decisions to make as to whether or not you know um, you know, how do we how do we move forward with this? But then what you what you're probably describing here is is, is something actually that's a, a, such as a large scale across the UK and probably other markets um, that that we're going to see a lot more of this, and the analytics is going to help us do that at pace. And I guess Peter, if I can just um, ask a question here, you know, when we think about the lending decisions that are being made. You know, lending decisions today, it, you know, it's a committee of people that have to make a lending decision, right? When we think about it, it's not just first line, but there is a, a, a combination of first, second, third line of defences that have to go together, think about the risk holistically. 
I guess, how do we see, you know, a technology, like an application process that Alex has just talked us through with the committees and the frictions, if I can say that, that you tend to see with the first, second and third line of defences? Well, I think we've, yeah, as, as we said, you know, the, to reduce customer friction, most organisations are looking to, you know, uh, reduce the number of inputs that go into a credit decision, the number of touch points uh, and really utilising technology. But if that technology is based solely on, you know, self declarations uh, and financial statements, you're missing a huge piece of the picture, um, yeah. which we need to supplement through, um, you know, uh, you know various sources of data. I think we, we're lucky in the UK to have something like Companies House, but um, as we know, the, 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 the information in Companies House can easily be manipulated. So it's really being able to have the um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, and, and the technology that sits behind that to really help decipher what that Companies House in the, in the UK case okay. is telling us. But I think, you know, as we go for, for an organisation like HSBC, where we're global, we work with dis different sources. I think in some markets, um, we do have things like you know, um, lending registers. So we, the banks are lending to a client, that really helps. But again, it hasn't proved infallible to a committed fraudster. Uh, yeah. So it's more work to do on this. But that, I guess that also goes to, it, it helps be a good reputational angle to it as well, right? What you're doing is you're becoming your systems and the technology is helping you become self-pleasing, become better in the community. And so there's better governance structure around it. Um, I, I guess, Peter, I just have one more question before we move on is, you know, when we think about the application processes and the mindset of people or the, the way, the direction in which we're going in, you know, the notion of cognitive bias tends to come up a fair bit. Um, I just wanted to get your opinion on, you know, is there a cognitive bias around this and how we look at this today? I think so. I think there definitely is, uh, particularly where you, you know, you're, you're invested uh, as a salesperson in that relationship. You you, you believe what you've been told. And uh, I was speaking to, um, to to one of your colleagues uh, earlier on today about how, you know, I've seen that that reaction. You know, it's 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 people take it so personally, um, and that's that's what fraudsters are relying on. They're relying on your confidence and your trust, uh, and they're abusing that systemically. Um, I think the, the cognitive bias piece is challenging and this is why this kind of tooling is so useful because it, it very quickly helps you get over that cognitive bias. There's, there's unlikely to be a rational explanation for what we're seeing here. Uh, the last point I'll make on this is I think it also points to probably the banks being a little bit lax and this isn't a UK issue, this is, this is I've seen this in many markets, a reluctance to call a fraud a fraud and it allows these people to repeat the same patterns, the same approach and I think if we were to probably look at this case in a bit more detail, we'll probably find that four or five banks have been the victim of this, yeah. simply written it off as a credit loss and moved on which has allowed these, these bad actors in the community, in the market to probably not only defraud the banks, but they probably defrauded small businesses, they probably defrauded individuals along the way. These people have no ethics. Uh, and the, the more we can do uh, as, a, as a financial institution to, to take these people out of the system and make high quality reports to law enforcement, the better. And, and that ties in nicely to, to the next poll that we have, um, which is around what is the most predictor indicator of fraud risk? So I would love our audience to participate in this poll. Is the most predictive uh, indicator financial statements, ratios and credit scores? Is it cash flows and counterparty analysis? Is it past performance and repayments? Involvement of facilitators or professional enablers, or is it device, behavioural, and biometric patterns? And I think Ivan, I'll start with you because it could be a combination of one of these, all of these. Um, I mean, we were restricted to five for the poll, but from your perspective, what do you think from what just Peter's just said about what is the best indicator or metric that we should be looking at? Is it all of them? So I think that's a bit of a loaded question. I definitely think as much information as is possible is always a good thing um, when it comes to trying to identify fraud. The reality is this needs to fit inside of a process though. And so um, just as Peter mentioned, the, the, the sort of push towards reducing the input, the, the reliance on a customer to input data, reducing, reducing the reliance on some of those standard um, market indicators, but considering actually there's a wealth of other data out there from 
um, <coughs> registry providers from bureaus, intelligence sources, and also within within the financial institution, knowledge of that customer, both as a customer, but also as a counterparty um, in previous relationships. So some of the items on here around counterparty analysis, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to understand, uh, you know, the, the sort of group's thoughts on actually how much counterparty analysis is used as part of core decisioning today, because certainly I've seen in some of the cases that we've been working on, both with clients in in um, in the context of the banks and in government with some of the programs that we're doing at a scheme level, that actually there's a huge wealth of indicators that are, are currently not necessarily being used. And so bringing those into this um, sort of process can be so valuable context, such valuable context to the decision makers. Um, and it actually doesn't increase the customer contact on it. In fact, if anything, it can reduce that um, is, is what I've seen. Perfect. And I'd encourage everybody to share their insights and all questions using the question box on the on the panel as well. Uh, Peter, from, from your experience and what you do at HSBC, do you tend to agree with what Ivan said in, in terms of um, the predictive indicators before I share the answers of the poll? Well, I, I think it's really interesting that uh, Ivan mentioned the counterparty analysis. Uh, HSBC, we've worked uh, with contacts on that for a number of years on, on understanding uh, the the the, tra uh, the patterns and trends in our uh, trade and receivable finance business, uh, and that's been invaluable in in understanding you know changes to um, you know our customers' behaviour, changes to their concentrations, and you know um, we've obviously used it not only for fraud but for also AML purposes, and yeah. um, it's definitely been a very reliable indicator. Um, and you know we're able to get very high quality uh, red flags and alerts through that. But I think um, absolutely right. All of these are important. I wouldn't at this point say, um, depending on where you're on the segment, you know, the top end of the book, you are going to be relying perhaps a little bit more on financial statements, you know, for listed companies, you know, but for your mid-market names, your unlisted names, you know, it's actually probably more about, um, you know, who, who are they involved with? Who are their advisors? You know, past performance, the cash flow is absolutely critical. How much of that cash flow can you really get comfortable with? Um, and how does that, how's that pattern and, you know, what, what's the trends in that? Um, but actually becoming increasingly relevant is obviously the device and biometrics. Roshni, just before you share the answers, I just had another point to add on this. Um, and it's around like leading and lagging indicators, because I think, you know, repayments and performance of repayments of a loan facility has been used in, in a lot in credit um, as a as an indicator of potential risk but in my mind it's often too late and we've seen that a lot on some of these COVID loan schemes where the business has traded successfully for some time they've taken the loan uh, and then when it comes due for repayment maybe a year later because there was very generous uh, government terms suddenly they've said oh no I, I, I've, I've stopped trading I, I can't and so that is almost one of the the early signs that you might see that there's a problem and in my mind that's probably way too late I think using cash flows and counterparties on their actual transaction data so who they pay and receive money from is much more of a leading indicator um, and and that's something that I don't think classic you know credit risk does a lot of today i think that's probably one of the challenges if i'm honest is a lot of credit is focused on rather old financial statements um and you've talked a bit about the potential professional enablers through the auditors there peter um but you know it might take nine months to get a, a view of a financial statement an auditor um but actually cash flows are dynamic they're real time they're daily and you can really start to see money flows in and out plus ideally identify the counterparty to get a much richer view of who are they interacting with and why and i would say that's much more of a leading indicator um, that you can do sort of to detect fraud much much more early on but i'll let you share the uh, results now so i think alex i and peter everybody agrees with you uh, 50 percent of today's um, participants believe cash flows and counterparty analysis is the most predictive um, indicator of fraud risk, um, so followed by involvement of facilitators or professional enablers at 22%, and then 11% of our audience thought it was either financial statements or past uh, performance and repayment. So I think there's there's definitely a common um, an agreement where you know Alex that you've just summarised really well. 
the importance of cash flows and counterparty analysis, not just for fraud risk, but how that could be an enabler into the credit risk uh, department and using that more above and beyond on how they think about it today. So thank you very much to our audience for participating in our poll. And, and thank you, Ivan, Alex, and Peter, sharing your thoughts on that as well. I think we're going to slightly change uh, directions a little bit, Ivan, if that's okay with you, um, to share a little bit of your experiences and what you have seen from that global nature, you know, in, in around fraud. But what do you believe to be the areas that is going to help prevent future fraud and ultimately the credit losses if we think about the relationship between fraud and, and credit? Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on around that. Yeah, sure. So um, I think in terms of one of the points that came up uh, earlier on in the in the sort of summary of global trends was around the push for growth. Um, and certainly I've I've been seeing that there is definitely an appetite to build the balance sheet, bring new customers in to actually do that also via making making the process easier, faster um, for customers that are coming through that through through the door essentially so as part of that naturally um two things happen one everything happens a lot faster so faster decision cycles there's less opportunity to um, spend time on each decision um, but also there's fewer human touch points in those processes so um what we're seeing is that um whereas perhaps for a certain size of business you might have had dedicated relationship managers the volumes are increasing so therefore their portfolio managers who have far less interaction directly with those customers so when you have that situation and you've got fewer human interactions mm -hmm. the, you lose the sniff factor that would have been relied upon for people to sort of actually just get a sense of whether or not they trust the person with whom you're trying to do business. So the whole process changing, digitizing, becoming faster is going to create all sorts of um, impacts to the business. And so one of the features that I know from um, speaking to a number of clients at the moment is, is a real um, sort of driving factor for them is how do we harden ourselves against some of these risks? So how do we make ourselves a difficult target for fraudsters um, as part of that cycle? Um, and so what often, um, just like we saw in the poll results just now, people are talking about trying to use different types of data um, that are already available uh, to, to the organization, things like who they're doing transactions with and what we know about them. Who else transacts with those counterparties? Do we do they do they look like a, a big multinational that should support a supply chain or or do they not look like that? Um, and so actually taking advantage of data driven approaches to that to automate some of the risk assessment process can be really helpful in a world where we've got relationship managers that are managing much larger portfolios of business than they they were previously. So I think step one for me is all around that change in the way the cycle's working and the change in the business operations um, is, is what I've seen. Um, Peter, any thoughts on what you've seen in relation to kind of the changes and in the way we operate? Well, I think I think the sniff factor. I love the fact you mentioned that, uh, Ivan, because I think that's what it's about. It's about that instinct. Uh, and I was reading a, a note that, uh, that that came my way uh, recently, and it's about that gut feel you have. Uh, and I do think you're absolutely right. There's a there's a volume play here. You know, we expect a lot of frontline staff um, to to make those sales um, and you know ask maybe the first and second question. But if we can if we can get through those, it, it feels like we're ready to we're ready to learn and we're ready to get comfortable and. I do think we often start small. We we, we build trust over time, um, but uh, you know some of the some of what we thought were maybe the best relationships we've had um, actually began to go wrong a lot longer, a lot, lot earlier in that in that journey, uh, and it's because we that trust was abused. So I think having having eyes on through the the, the relationship lifestyle is important. I think there will be absolute fraudsters who are out to to, to defraud the banks, um, but I actually think an awful lot of you know well-intentioned customers will resort to these um, you know less than legitimate approaches to, to either prop up a business or to uh, inflate their, their their profitability and their viability um, and um, you know what, what I do find interesting is, is there isn't enough collaboration across the banks actually you know when banks are exiting um, you know uh, it, it's done you know under the guise of you know it's a risk appetite play or something like that I think we, we could be sharing intelligence more effectively so that's a really good point, actually, and in, in some of the work that we've been doing with government where we've worked into bank um, and we've actually got some sharing of that intelligence, we, we've seen firsthand the impact that can have, um, you know, knowing uh, that, that you've got a, a relationship between uh, five lenders with the same organisation three of them have a, have some knowledge of that organization but the other two don't 
um, you know, absolutely that from a fraud standpoint, um, from a core fraud standpoint, there's definitely good value in sharing that data in terms of trying to push it out of the industry, out of the market, um, and just making the, the industry more resilient to some of those challenges. Um, but also, I think that um, even just internally, um, where you're sort of looking across those different data sets, we're seeing um, a, sort of a desire for more contextualized decision, um, d decision points. So, um, you know, taking advantage of as much information as possible to both improve what you consider to be risky, but also to identify those data points that give you confidence that actually there may be maybe one or two red flags on this particular case. But we've got a wealth of evidence that tell us that we should be trusting um, with this organization. So, you know, it works two ways, I think, in the risk assessment process. Uh, and often there's not enough weight applied to some of the mitigating factors that can give you good feelings about a customer. Uh, and increasingly, um, you know, getting it wrong has a cost. So if you're going to put in an automated system, um, if it goes wrong, the, the impact that creates is distrust amongst the sales teams, amongst the, the, the leadership that actually need that reliance on that technology. Otherwise, the system breaks down and they don't, they don't, if there's no trust there, it becomes problematic. So, you know, using all of the context that's available is increasingly a theme of, of discussion as, as I've seen it. Um, and that certainly is true both on the customer themselves, but also their full supply chain. Um, and I think it works the other way around as well, looking at major events that occur, having that ability to look at the impact of those major events, understand the exposure in as rapid a fashion as is possible, um, because it's not always your customer that's defaulted, but sometimes you feel the pain. Yeah, I think we, we had a couple of events like that uh, fairly recently, haven't we, in, in that supply chain space here in the UK, um, but but also um, in, in parts of Asia and the Middle East again, where, you know, it's, it's the interconnectivity of, of business um, and, um, you know, the, the, the reliance placed on, you know, in some cases, a little more than trust, actually. You know, if we look at, you know, several high profile uh, situations, you know, it was it was a case of, you know, money that never existed sitting in an account in, 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 a, in, in the Philippines. Right. It's 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 the audacity sometimes that, that throws people off um, when actually, you know, we should be asking those questions. I guess, Peter, if I can ask a question, and Ivan, you touched on this a little bit as well, is when we think about, when you look at the slide, right, there's there's a lot of things that are important to organizations today. Fewer human touch points, better scoring, contextual decision making with more data, faster cycles, automation, profitability. Peter, from your perspective, I mean, HSBC has this as a priority across everything is a priority. But what are you finding is you know does something have to give in order to get better profitability or to get faster decisions have you know what are you seeing from hsbc's perspective in in what do they focus on for your touch points and faster decisions or do they want to focus on the analytics and and getting more at what they currently have i appreciate you minute to share everything but any insights that you have in how do you handle some of these points that ivan's talked about um, in a more consistent and, and connected way HSBC history has always been in, in trade finance. We, we see ourselves as a trade bank and we, we, we thrive on that. I think there's, there's still, um, you know, uh, certain markets where we, could, we can do more in that supply chain space and we've got big ambitions there and, and a lot of investment going in. That's for me, is a really good business because it gives you that, uh, that, that, that transparency sometimes that you need. You can see the, the pinch points and, you know, we can see through the macro events we're experiencing right now not only from a credit perspective, can you see those potential, you know, what's coming down the road, but actually also from a fraud perspective. So I think for me, that's really important. I think for me as well, the, the way we, the way we've perhaps lent money without having sufficient visibility into the operating accounts. I think a lot of banks are looking at that. Hey, look, am I really happy participating in a club deal, putting my reliance really on the bank with the operating accounts um, and, and not having visibility? Um, if you've got nothing to hide, I see no reason why I shouldn't have visibility of those operating accounts, even if they're, they're with another bank. Um, that's not always an easy conversation, but um, I'd feel much better having an awkward conversation with a client or, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the club, you know, the, the club leader than, than having a big, uh, big impairment on my book. So we've got to, we've got to balance that. Uh, certainly at the bottom end of the book, and it's at bottom end, but our, our business banking franchise, we do, we do want to acquire high quality customers with scope to grow and we want to grow with them. Um, and, and every time we lose money to a credit loss or to a fraud, it's a setback for us. So uh, we, we, we're going to continue to invest in business banking. Uh, we, we want to be that bank of choice uh, for small entrepreneurs. 
Uh, we want to protect them, but we also want to make sure that that system that, that we're promoting and that, that the re reduction in customer friction, ease of account opening, ease of credit isn't abused by by people who are who are setting out to do so. And I guess, Alex, from your perspective, and then I, Ivan, your perspective, do you see there's a trade-off with prioritization from a credit risk perspective, Alex, first, on trying to get some of this right, but some something else has to give? I think um, there's different levels of like risk knowledge within a bank. So you just mentioned there, Peter, around the, the trade teams. They, in my mind, I mean, I used to be a credit analyst, but mine was more of an annual review process whereas the trade team saw the daily invoices being paid not paid faster slower and actually what you found was they were much closer to the the, the life and the activity of the customer day in day out versus the the, the trade team so i think the, the, the ideal goal is to be able to break down the silos in the bank. So whether it's within credit, but you've got a trade credit team and a core credit team, or whether it's within fraud and you might have different teams with different data points, really you need to bring that all together in one place and surface some of those risks to the, to, to the teams. That, in my mind, gives you a stronger credit process, but also a much stronger fraud process. And, and I, to be honest, I really fail to see how they're not so well intertwined. I just think that we, we've seen lots of examples of people who, um might have a weak uh angle around corporate governance and we can see that through some of these highly connected social links um weak auditors i mean a weak company chooses a weak auditor basically and, and, it, and it's you know there's lots of research out there uh, showing this this type of um interaction i think the challenge is in the credit world is how do you get that data in front of you, of you and make it contextual because not every Bit of bad news is something you need to act on you really need to have some threshold monitoring there to be able to say that is some event that i need to know about that is unusual that is a surprise um yeah. so that's it has to be um integrated i think is and, and contextualized perfect ivan. thank you um ivan just in one minute um you have a global hat on we have a lot of um uh, participants coming from across the pond in the us as well um, from that perspective, from your global hat, is there any trade-offs with the kind of the key points that you've talked about today? Um, well, I think that um, I would phrase it that there's some real opportunities. Um, so, you know, I think knowledge of the customer is key. If you're going to make a, a decision, you should be making the right decision, whether that's on the limit or the amount or the collateral. It doesn't really matter what dy dynamic of the relationship. Knowledge of the customer is king. And that's why in, in the trade relationships that you just men mentioned, Alex, they're living those transactions. You're, you're part of that business almost. You really understand it. Um, in, other, in other situations, in other frame of reference, you have much less intimate knowledge of that customer so finding ways to improve your knowledge of the customer in the way that they're doing their business can be absolutely fundamental to both protecting the business but also unlocking opportunities can we be more aggressive can we offer them more as a business because even though they're in a certain situation we've got better knowledge that trumps that and we really do trust that this business is going places um, that that would be my my summary view Thank you very much, Ivan. I want to let, spend a little bit of time on questions as well. So I want to spend one minute in terms of where we collectively as a group um, and Ivan, Alex, Peter, feel free to chime in on this slide is, you know, there's a lot of priorities ahead, which almost goes back to the first slide that we presented around uh, the global, local and, and UK prioritization, you know, enhancements of technology, getting that integrated view of risk, enriching existing internal data capabilities pretty early on in the client interaction when you're thinking about being customer first how can you enable that technology to enable automation get that information in a more smooth and systematic manner to flow through from um, origination down to um, exiting when we think about esg and you think about the concept of greenwashing and I don't know Peter if you haven't have uh, an opinion here but as you know everybody's going towards green lending you know greenwashing becomes more of a more of a topic of discussion at board level so how can we increase the accuracy and effectiveness of our data and our systems to help with the ESG mandate and and the and the goals that we have around that but thinking beyond technology and ESG and thinking beyond the risk and fraud assessment, you need to be able to know your network first to identify a network. So really understanding who is it that I'm lending to and who is it that's associated with my borrower and my lender to think about 
their relationships and conne con connections. And you know, we've all touched on today about the supply chain risk assessment and the holistic risk assessment that comes uh, with that. Um, and then there's there's other priorities around portfolio um, back remediation, thinking about the expansion of fraud detection and assessment, and very much thinking about data to drive risk management, business continuity, helping fraud teams, risk teams to make better, faster, better informed decisions um, we, is what we see in terms of the priorities ahead. Uh, Peter, do you tend to agree with that? And I know there's a question for you, Peter, as well. So maybe I can tie in the question with your thoughts on the year ahead. There's a question for Peter around do you see the challenges and opportunities that you've discussed today to be the same for organizations like HSBC, but also for smaller organizations that are in the tier two and the tier three space? I think very much so. I think, um, you know, our, our results, of, I think everyone's very happy with HSBC's results, I think. Um, but, you know, you're one fraud away or one big credit loss away from from having a very average set of results. Uh, and I think obviously that 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 is exacerbated the, the, the smaller your organization is. Um, so I think it's really important that we we manage you know, credit and fraud risk very, you know, in a very similar way. I think it, it does tend to work well. Um, one comment on on the ESG on the ESG piece, without a doubt, in my mind, it is going to become a target for fraudsters, whether they are you know at a company level or individuals. Uh, and I think you know the 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 cheaper credit, because I don't think credits that is going to get a bit more expensive in the short term. But there is going to be a price differential there uh, for for ESG loans. The um, the potential for abuse of those schemes and those loans is, is significant for me. Uh, and I think there are some some real flavors in the UK already that, 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 you know, that we're monitoring very closely, but I'm seeing that in other markets as well. Um, we've got to get ahead of it. We've got to treat ESG and greenwashing fraud like we do lending fraud, and we've got to converge those two. It's another piece of convergence, really. Uh, and it all comes down to that, that, that uh, you know, Thing we keep talking about you know that that being being skeptical you know really yeah. understanding your customer as Ivan was saying getting into some of that detail and, and not being afraid to ask some questions perfect um we have time for a couple more questions um if you have any questions please feel free to use the question uh, panel on the right hand side of your uh, screen um another question has come in um, Ivan, you mentioned that you've been doing some work with the government um, earlier on in the call. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what 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 have you learnt from from that project? And 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 Alex, is there anything that you see that crosses over to risk with that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, there are restrictions on on some of the things I can talk about, but there are bits that I can. Um, uh, and there, there has been some press releases around this work. Um, so in terms of uh, the first thing I would observe is that actually um, quite often uh, public private partnerships are very hard um, to get going. Um, and this was a situation that actually demanded a, a partnership to, to work and it, it has worked. So it's shown that that can be can be a reality, even though there are some challenges. Um, the other factors that I'd say we've noticed are, you know, it, the sharing of that information across the industry has been invaluable. Um, also, though, building upon that, um, some of the trends and themes that we've discussed today around phoenixing operations, around facilitators, around some of the audit firms, um, you know, these are um, data points and these are things that we have observed through those um, programs that have, have been, been shown to actually be quite telling. Um, so when I, one of the phrases Alex used earlier in, in, in this discussion was that um, weaker firms tend to go with weaker with, with, with the weaker audit companies. Um, you know, there are some telltale signs out there. Um, you know, even if you're going to place reliance upon the financial statements, you can use those indicators to really get a good impression as to the level of reliance upon which you can you can place, whether that's because of the use of a company formation agent that is well known or within the context of an audit firm or, or other types of enablers. So um, I'm, I can't go into too much detail on the topic, but I can certainly hopefully that given a flavour of some of what we can share. Perfect, thank you. Alex, 30 seconds and then I need to wrap up the webinar. So 30 seconds, look I would just say there's a lot of data out there that is very useful. So around weak director governance, I would specifically look at 
backdating, for example, and just unusual amounts of changes of directors in a short period. So we saw a company with eight, eight directors between March 2020 and October 2020, all backdating, all overlapping, very, very strange, plus eight new addresses in the same period. Um, it's a great way of using that data to say, I've now got a better view of understanding the skill or the risk of the directors. And in most cases, it, it just brings out risk very, very clearly and can be used to enhance models. So that's what I would say. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Alex. Um, we've got more questions, but we'll answer them directly um, after this webinar. With that, I would like to thank Ivan and Alex for the insights and the experiences that were shared today. And a special thanks to Peter that shared some valuable insights from within from HSBC. If you do have any other questions, we will be sharing the presentation and the recording with it. Uh, please contact your uh, local representative in um, Asia, America and UK, and we'll be happy to help you. With that, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you and goodbye.